Well, um, I'm Lena van Tilburg for Buzz News, and with me in the studio is somebody that all South Africans would recognize. It's Tasha Sideris from the Tasha's Group. Tasha's is so well known in South Africa. I think everybody knows about Tasha's. And now they are coming to London. Um, after an expansion in the Middle East, they are hopping over to Europe. That Natasha's so nice to have you with us today. Um, thanks for joining us. Linda, thank you for having me. Exciting what, times. Exciting times. What and nerve-wracking. Is it? Is it nerve-wracking? Yeah, I think London's a very competitive market. Um, you know, I've always been a little bit scared of London. When I, when I first decided to expand out of South Africa, I had a choice between London, Australia, the United States, and, and the, the Middle East. And I chose the Middle East for very specific reasons. And I stayed away from London for very specific reasons, high barriers to entry. We all know what the, what the issues are around staffing and trying to find trying to find staff and then find staff that will actually stay. Um, and then, of course, uh, the rentals, high food costs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, yes, I am very nervous. And, you know, we've been very successful both in South Africa and the Middle East. But that's not to say that we'll be successful in London. It's anyone's game. So we don't have a big master plan. We're going to open one. Deliver good service, great food. Hopefully, people love our interior, and and then we'll take it from there. So, yeah, I am. I'm nervous. I'm I'm hell of a nervous. Well, you you t- chose a fantastic spot at Battersea Park, which has just been renewed. It opened just more than a year ago, and it's the go-to place. It's just got this vibe. It does have Why a there? great energy. Why there? So when we first started exploring the idea of opening in London, we we went to the obvious areas. You know, the Marlebones. Um, uh, I, I, I was pitching for a site on Sloan Street. Uh, I love Chelsea, uh, Mayfair, you know, um, and, and obviously those are areas we'd love to be in. But then we went to Battersea and I just thought, you know what, I think because it's a new development and the location that they offered us outside the entrance of the power station next to the biggest Zara in, 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 in the country. And when I say that it's not as competitive, what I mean is not to say that the retailers and the restaurateurs aren't competitive in Battersea. They certainly are. But it's not overly saturated yet. Whereas going to an area like maybe Marlebone, there are hundreds and hundreds of restaurants uh, in, in central London. So a little bit more, more nerve-wracking and I think less competition. Not less competition in terms of quality of competition, less competition in terms of volume. So we've got an opportunity to really stand out there and, and, and the site within the already iconic precinct is incredible. Um, and we've got a great relationship with the landlord. So I think all in all, um, a, a good a good first choice. And uh, would it be still have that South African flavor? I'm bringing Tasha's Athol Square, my firstborn. You know, we'll be 18 years. Uh, we were 18 years, sorry. On the 15th of September, we turned 18. That's when I opened Athol Square, and I am bringing Athol Square to London. And the menu is very much Natasha's menu. We've upstyled a couple of our dishes, changed a bit of the plating, and of course, there's about fifteen or twenty things that'll be unique to to London. As always, we like to up the ante and and, and up the standards as we go along. Um, and understanding that London is an extremely competitive market, we've had to do that. We've had to tweak some stuff. However. Um, it's still a Tasha's at its heart and the, and you'll find your good old classics on the menu. I think 70% of the menu is still classic. And one thing about your restaurants, the interior is so important. What have you done? Who are the designers? Is there something South African in there? So, so we work with uh, Vahal, um, a South African couple, Debolt and, and Nadine, um, Debolt Strubak, Nadine Buck. Um, and they've been doing our interiors. Oh my God, Nadine's going to kill me. I actually don't know how many years, but they have designed from store number five. We're now going to be at 39 restaurants at the end of next year. So they've done 35 of our, of our stores. Um, so same designers, South African couple based in Dubai now. They, they had moved to Australia. They moved to Dubai recently. And um, we've got a couple of nods to South Africa, South African artists. We've worked with Bronze Age to do our beautiful counter, our signature counter. We've worked with Ilona O'Neill to do our installation. But yes, it's, it's going to look exactly like Athol Square. Take us back to 2005 when it started and the journey and what the impact of COVID. 
Well, you know, when I first opened, so let me let me start a little bit back from that. So my intention was to continue my degree. I studied uh, psychology and I did a BA psychology, sociology, and I was going to open this cafe and I was going to go back and, and continue my studies. So it was going to be, I, I bought an apartment right next to Apple Square and I thought I'll have my cafe and I'll study at the same time. And we opened Tasha's in Athol. And the intention was to just have one. There were no big plans at all. Uh, like there aren't for London either. No big plans. Let's just open one and see where it goes. And we opened Athol Square. And it was a rip-roaring success. We had queues out the door. We were serving 1,200 people a day. I had, to, I had to rally the troops and get some friends to come and work behind the bar. It was just absolutely, it was pandemonium. It was crazy. Um and since then, you know, a couple of years later, we uh, I converted one of my one of my restaurants in Better View. Previously, it was a Nino's. I was part of the Nino's franchise. I converted that store into a Tasha's, and then the journey began, and we started opening restaurants. I did a deal with famous brands, as you know. Um, can't get my dates mixed up, Joe. But anyway, a, a couple of years later, I did a deal with famous brands, and we embarked on a journey to roll out the brand in a franchise model, and then. In 2014, I opened in Dubai. I was still in partnership with Famous Brands, but I also owned the restaurants in Dubai. So I was both franchisee and franchisor. Uh, and then, as you know, uh, during COVID, I um, had an opportunity to buy Famous Brands out. We had been negotiating for some time. Um, and then, and then you know, as COVID hit, we, we started really putting down the details of the deal. And coming out of COVID, we sealed that deal and I bought the business back. Um and since then, we've been growing exponentially, and we now don't only have Tasha's as a brand. We have nine brands under our belt, soon to be 10, uh, including some beach restaurants, including two bars, including uh, a new brand that we're about to open today, actually, called the African Lounge, um, Flamingo Room. I have a Greek restaurant. I have another bar called Galaxy Bar. So it's been a, a, an amazing journey. I think, you know... Um, Tasha's will always be the mother brand, the most, the, 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 the brand, I'm not going to say that we give the most love and attention to, but certainly the brand that is the glue that holds everything together. But because I am a creative, um, you know, I've always wanted to show that we can do more than just cafes. So we've got a couple of bars, we've got some fine dining, we've got a beach restaurant, we've got a Greek restaurant, and we'll continue to, to expand and, 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 and grow. So, so that's been the journey so far in a, in a very... Short summary: There's been a lot of pain and tears along the way. It hasn't been as easy as I've uh, as I've made it out to be. Some lots of lots of bumps along the road, but all all good and all amazing learnings. Well, I remember in the interview with Alec Hogg, you said you actually started, you know, with the first money you got from loan sharks. I mean, that's correct. That's correct, and it actually was for Athol Square and the second store. Uh, you know, converting the the Ninos in Better View to Tasha's also took money from a loan shark because the banks wouldn't look at me. So, so Natasha, where does this um, absolute drive come from? And and the passion for food and for beautiful environments? Um, so my mom was very, very artistic. Uh, she was a dressmaker and used to love painting. And, and, and I think the artistic side certainly comes from my mom. Uh, and she was a great cook. But the, the food side and the people side from my father... Uh, unbelievable restaurateur was a qualified chef. Actually, studied as a chef, and 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 just a great restaurateur all round. So I think the interest in the business came from a combination of my mom and my dad. The drive I've always had from a young girl. I was head girl at Saheti. Um, I was. I don't look at me now that I put on weight, but I was Victrix Ladorum for swimming and athletics seven times in a row. Uh, I, I, when I get a task, I'm pretty determined and I and I want to make a success of it, but also the, make sure that the people that have contributed to the success are also benefiting from that because I do have a love of people. And I think this, the, the absolute drive comes from, suppose I'm a hell of an ambitious person. The drive's not from money. Money is just a, uh, something that happens along the way if you're lucky. Um, it's more about proving to myself and to others that myself and my team can take an idea and actualize it and make it a success. And we've been really blessed so far um, that all of the ideas we've come up with have been successful. 
And and how important is the people around you? Because I know that some of the other restaurateurs, like Ocean Basket, that Grace Harding took a team from South Africa and yes. also her team from the Middle East to 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 establish the, yeah. the restaurants. Is that what you do as well? No, absolutely critical. I think, you know, the biggest threat to to growth for any company is a lack of training and a lack of imbuing your culture and your DNA on on the new staff that get hired. So I think ensuring that you've got existing DNA, existing culture, and that you invest a lot in training is key. If you don't do that and you go to a new market, like we go into the UK, um, if you don't bring some South African staff over, if you don't bring some staff from the Middle East over, it's most likely that you'll fail because the, the new people that have joined need to learn what is Tasha's, what is the culture, what is the service style, what is the, 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 the ethos around the food. And that can only come from training and experience. And the, and the staff have to pass that down, the existing staff. Well, everybody that says there's staffing problems in London, especially after Brexit, that the Europeans are not coming over. But have you had that those problems? Yeah, we certainly have. I think um, finding staff is, is very, very challenging in London. Um, you know, I think that the younger generation also have got a different view of hospitality. Um, hospitality is a really tough business. Um, and I think that there's a general culture, and I'm not going to call it laziness because it isn't laziness. It's just a different way of looking at, at work. And, you know, restaurants require 12, 14, 16 hour work days. Um, and that's what I'm used to. But, you know, we also have to change and adapt. And, 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 and for the younger generation, you know, change our, our style of restauranting to suit what the expectations are in terms of this new work ethic um, or this new style of working. So, yes, it, it has certainly been a challenge, but I think that the staff that we've managed to find are starting to understand our way of doing things, and I hope that they'll soon learn that as much as it is a culture of excellence and of hard work, that it is also a culture of reward, a culture of family, and a culture of giving back. So as much as we make demands on our staff, we also give back to our staff. And I'm, I'm, I think that's maybe where some restaurateurs make a mistake, is it's all take, 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 and no give. And I think that that's where the balance has got to come. So I'm hoping that we'll overcome those challenges. Time will tell. So how do you give back to, to um, people? Okay, so we make sure that we, we obviously pay properly. Uh, we don't skimp on, 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 on pay make sure that the salaries are actually pegged where they're supposed to be. We pay on time. Uh, we're known in Dubai as one of the best employers because we are never even half a minute late on, on releasing salaries. And that was even true in COVID. Everyone, all the staff got paid before any of the partners or the executives took any money out of the business. So paying on time. I think leave is an important one. I think everyone knows in our business that it is long hours. We're not clock watchers. So if someone does work extra hours, of course, they're going to get paid their overtime. But also, if they've been a particularly hardworking person, we'll say, take a couple of extra days leave and we don't clock that leave. So it doesn't get taken off their, off their normal leave pay. And I think small gestures also count for a lot, but they have to be sincere. So if the team have worked really hard, you're going to take them out for a lunch, you're going to buy them a meal. You, you know, there's small things that you can do to make people feel appreciated. It isn't all money related. A lot of it is time related. So how can you give back in terms of time? Um, and we try and do that by not being overly pedantic about leave. You know, people have worked extra hard, give them a couple of extra days. Um, you mentioned earlier that you bought it, um, Dasha's back from famous brands. Yeah. Why? What was what, what was behind that decision? Um, I think famous brands was a, a great partnership. It taught me a lot in terms of corporate governance. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a creative and a restaurateur at heart. I'm, I'm not really an admin and a corporate type of person. I'd never didn't know how to read a balance sheet or do a business plan. Everything was done from gut. I think that helped bring a lot of process into the business. But after that point, there was very little value that they could add only because their business models are totally different. You know, a steers and a debonairs, totally different beasts and animals to, to a tasha's that's everything's made on order. We spend all of this money on our interiors, lots of staff. Um, so it reached a point where I wasn't getting any more value from them. And I, I just went to them and said, listen, guys, I'm not, the partnership is unfairly balanced. I'm doing all of the work. 
and I'm not really getting any value from you as a partner. So allow me an opportunity to to buy you out. Um, it wasn't an easy deal. They didn't really want to let me go. Um, but uh, thank God, um, both Kevin and Darren were gents and 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 pushed towards me actually being able to buy the business back, which which has been incredible. You know, I've got my independence. I don't have to report to anyone. But also, I don't feel. I feel that all of the efforts that my brother and I put into the business, we are fairly rewarded and we're not having to share it with someone who isn't adding um, any value. Well, you took the big step now to for Europe. What's next? Uh, um, I think London's going to be a big one for us if if it all works out and if people start to love touches as much as the Middle East and in South Africa, then, then we'll shift our focus to, to London and we see an opportunity to open at least 20 touches in London. When I say London in the UK, 20 to 30 in the UK. Um, lots of people have approached us for the United States. We're not ready yet by, by a long mile. Then for our concept brands, what we call concept brands, the Flamingo Rooms, the Avlis, the African Lounges, uh, the Bungalows, I'd like to see a couple of those in every city that counts. So Paris, London, Ibiza, uh, Monaco, we'd like to open one in, in all of those places. So we've got big plans. And then, of course, we are looking, and I've spoken about this for years, but we'd like to bring Tasha's, a little bit of Tasha's to people's homes. And I'm talking only about the Tasha's brand now. So we are working closely with our designers on launching a retail range. So you'll be able to get Tasha's napkins, Tasha's plates, knives, forks, glassware, um, beautiful ceramic bowls, some objet, together with a cookbook. So, uh, you know, just we're going to call it Tasha's home and, and some of the furniture. Oh my goodness, it all sounds amazing. Thank it just you. It sounds so amazing. Thank you. I, I have to read you a message that yeah. I got from Grace Hardy. I want to say, well, good luck in London, and obviously we'll support you, and the South Africans will, uh, expats will definitely be there. Okay, what she said today was to, well, just, she said, Natasha has an insatiable drive. Londoners are in for a treat. Um, and you, she said, have a unique talent to turn breakfast, time alone, or a craving for a slice of cake into occasion like no other. Born with the fire and determination of South Africa, plus the soul of a fiery Mediterranean, that this woman and her team are going to blow you away. Get ready for a treat. Oh, wow. Very, very kind of Grace. And I think Grace is a formidable force as well. I think the work that Grace and I did and it was all Grace pushing really hard when we did the Restaurant Collective to help people during COVID. It just shows the, the tenacity and the passion that Grace has got for this business. And hats off to her. She's an extremely successful CEO and drives an amazing business. And her, her passion for the business is just tangible. You see it with her staff. They'll go to war for her. So thank you, Grace. And I hope you're rocking in London and we'll get together when I'm there on the 6th of November. Yeah, she said you you are a woman who led the restaurant industry during COVID, as you just said, and now are holding hands to enter the center of the world. Yeah. <laughs> well, lovely. Oh, Natasha Sedera, so, so, um, good luck. And good luck with London. And your plans just sound, oh, you're going to take over. Linda, please come and visit us. We're planning to open on the 14th, but let's try and get together before then. Thank you very, very much for your time and, and for listening to my story. 